how we're coming? Hello. Uh, hi, uh, hi. Hi. How are you? Oh. This is Shannon Taylor, and we're here with our old friend Richard Bay on The Conversation. And I'm the executive director, and I want you to see our old friend Richard. He's back in the pink from uh, California, and he's going to leave New York and go to Florida. So he's obviously lost his mind, because uh, who would, uh, not that New York is uh, such a great shakes, but uh, let me tell you something, between California and Florida, I'll stay here. So uh, before I turn it over to Richard, I have a few little uh, messages here in the holiday spirit of Thanksgiving. I was actually sent this by our dear friend Mel Parnes of B'nai Tzion. May your stuffing be tasty. May your turkey plump. We're vegetarians here and uh, they're in line with Farm Sanctuary. May your potatoes and gravy have never a lump. May your yams be delicious and your pies take the prize. And may your Thanksgiving dinner stay off your thighs. Richard, what do you think of this here? I, I think it's great poetry. Great poetry. <laughs> I, I can't claim it as a Blacks and Jews original, but but we just it's a little uh, late. We just went. <laughs> we, Thanksgiving has been has passed, right? So, well, Thanksgiving spirit is here. Hold on to it's it for the next us. Thanksgiving. <laughs> it's here with us now. Now, Richard, I wanna I wanna hear first of all a review of the latest movie that you did. Oh, the Bruno movie. Yes. Well, actually, it's coming out on DVD this week. And it's been on pay-per-view, and um, it uh, had really big weekend in the summer when it came out. It did 32 million the first weekend it came out. Uh, I got a phone call from some people. First of all, they asked me, would I be interested in bringing the Richard Bay show back? And I guess I can say this now because I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. But the movie's already out; it's all over. So I, I don't understand why. I, I, am I supposed to carry these secrets to my death? They called me, they asked me if I wanted to do uh, the Richard Bay show again, and I said, oh, yeah, sure, where are you going to do it? And they said, well, we think we could get a European sale for it, but first you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So they sent me a non-disclosure agreement, I signed it, and then they said, well, we don't really want to bring back the Richard Bay show, but have you ever heard of Sasha Baron Cohen? And I said, sure, big fan. I, I've even watched the, uh, some of the British episodes where he was Ali G, and they said, well, we'd like you to do a show a talk show, uh, you know, where he's playing Bruno for the new movie. So we shot it in Dallas. Um, I flew down there. We shot three different shows. They used one for the, uh, you know, for the movie. And um, it was, he's one of the most, I, I only saw him out of character, uh, you know, when the whole experience was over, when the shooting was over. But he was one of the most intense actors I've ever seen and uh, it was a lot of fun and some of the really funny stuff didn't even make it into the movie because we shot three different audiences three different kinds of shows we had a black audience we had a, uh, uh, a, a fairly generic audience and then we had a sort of uh, redneck uh, gun toting uh, your Bible thumping uh, Texas audience and um, and uh, some of the funny things happened in those other scenes but they couldn't use it because they eventually used uh, the show where most of the audience was African-American. But uh, it was fun. It was fun. Oh, that's and perfect funny. for us. Most of the audience was African-American. And here movie. you are on Blacks and Jews in Conversation. Now tell us why it was shot and stayed shot before an African-American audience. Well, because he was playing Bruno, a gay Austrian um, clothing designer who wanted to have a child. So he went to Africa, and I said, oh, how did you adopt a child in Africa? And he said, I, I didn't adopt him. I swapped him. I said, what, you swapped him? Yeah, I swapped him for an iPod. And um, I said, you swapped him for an iPod? And he goes, and the audience went crazy when they heard this. It just take off on Madonna and uh, Angelina Jolie and all of the other movie stars who go to... Uh, Molly or something to find a child to adopt. Uh, it's uh, sort of the Hollywood folk. So, he could, so, he, so the audience got very upset by this. And uh, he said, no, 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 it, it wasn't one of those little 8 gig iPods. It was a 32 gig iPod they gave me at the MTV Awards. It's a very special iPod. And, um, and then eventually they, they 
caught the baby. You're not laughing. <laughs> they, he says, have you ever been to Africa? It's full of African-Americans. And the audience was going, no, it's full of Africans. No, it's full of African-Americans. They're just like you. So um, uh, then they brought the baby out. The baby had fallen asleep in his arms. And uh, I pointed this out and he says, yeah, I, I, I don't know what's wrong with him. All he does is sleep and poop, sleep and poop. I give him uh, espresso all day long, and he doesn't even doesn't even keep him awake. And um, oh, there were other things. He 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 was uh, he took the he said the baby was a good a guy magnet, you know, and help him meet other guys. Uh, and then he showed pictures of the baby, and they they got more and more, you know, offensive the pictures. And by the end of the show. A good portion of the audience was getting up, walking out, and I, did, you know, try to talk to them as they were leaving. And uh, some women tried to pray for him during the middle of the broadcast, uh, you know, saying he was going to hell. And at the end of the show, they they had a, uh, I, I assume it was an actor, but I don't know, but they had somebody come in from child uh, welfare and take the baby away from him. So. It was a long segment. Actually, I when I came back, I told my friends, ah, you won't see me in this. I'll be off camera. I'm the facilitator. You may hear my voice. But when the when they used it for the for the movie, they actually put said the Richard Bay show, and it ran for about six minutes. And uh, if I had known they were going to use so much of me, I, uh, I I I would have asked for more money. Now, the uh, the reason our audience has to get the context is because when I and so many other wonderful people did your shows in the past, uh, when, when our select group were chosen to do your show, your, your people are talking and the Richard Bay show was not your average couch sitting uh, ty type <laughs> of fandango. We, we were not the Phil Donahue show. Right. We, we, you know, I did a show which, which was one of the first to discuss the subject of inter biracial and interfaith dating and marriage, which we just had a program on under our organization in Stuyvesant High School. And, and uh, it, it eventually resulted in a whole page in the New York Post. Uh, and, and we had actually combative type of audience participation verbally. So I imagine that they went directly to you because you were the master type of host in this situation. And they were creating a similar situation with this ridiculous type of figure who, if I ever saw, I'd be walking out too. Am I correct? Well, one could hope that's the case. <laughs> I think they just called me because I was available and willing to do it. But uh, frankly, I think they were lucky to have me because um, it was a free form. Uh, you know, the, 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 a lot of the questions weren't set up beforehand. Uh, uh, you had to w work with an audience that grew more and more antagonistic as it went on and you knew how to handle them. You had to set it up in a way so that people would even believe such an outrageous story. And the way I did that, we'd, we had real guests uh, before he came on. The topic of the show was unusual parenting. So I had a Wiccan who was raising his kids to be witches. I had a husband and wife and they had a child that was growing up and the mother was a stripper and the father didn't want her to be a stripper. Well, he didn't want the kid to find out. And then, of course, Bruno would come out and, and do the next segment. But I started the show by saying, um, uh, we were in Texas. I said, well, recently here in Texas, you had a situation with, uh, you know, with the, with the, uh, the Mormon uh, conclave where the state came in and took the children away from them and said, uh, you know, this amounts to child abuse, the way you're raising these children. And... Um, and, and there are other, uh, you know, uh, constitutional advocates who say uh, uh, this is a, a freedom of religion, um, uh, you know, uh, case, and that you shouldn't be removing the children from the parents, and the, and the children are being traumatized by this. So, and there are both sides to this. And I said to the audience, how many of you think that when, when, when the state believes you're not raising your children properly, they should come in and be able to take the child away? And, and half the audience raised their hand. And I said, how many of you think uh, that they shouldn't be allowed to come in and a parent should be able to raise their children in any way that they see fit? And about half the audience raised their hand. So I said, well, all right, well, just think of that as you hear these stories. But when they heard the Bruno story, um, I think every person in that audience eventually uh, was happy to see uh, 
the state come in and take the child away, even though it was a, it was a fictional relationship. What was the, uh, the point of having him uh, as gay? He, in this first movie, I think he was portraying himself as uh, a Jew hater. And, uh, and uh, I got the point that he was making fun of all the Jew hatred in Eastern Europe and Russia, although a lot of other Jews thought the opposite. I knew what he was trying to do, and I thought he was brilliant at it. But what is the point here of making himself gay, and was there any negative reaction from the gay community? Well, yes to both, of, well, yes to the second question, to the first question. Uh, I think he would hear, just as you said, uh, Borat to some degree, uh, you know, mocked the ignorance um, of anti-Semitism. This movie, you know, I think even more pervasively mocked homophobia and um, the latent aspects of it, the more overt aspects of it. And in order to do that, he made Bruno every homophobe's worst nightmare. This was a stereotypical gay man who only thought about uh, you know, anal sex from the minute he woke up, who was superficial, who was into fashion, who was uh, um, um, always looking to pick up another man. So if you you know if you're a person that didn't like gay, this is a guy that it, even if you were straight, he would think that you were really gay underneath and that you wouldn't be able to resist him. So if you had any kind of homophobic feelings, um, you know uh, this character would tend to uh, incite them, justify them, even if this was a real depiction of a uh, you know of a gay man. And of course it isn't; it's a comic depiction. So I mean, he had a scene in the movie where. Um, he tried to seduce Ron Paul, the libertarian candidate for president, and Ron Paul got up and ran out of the room. He had another scene where he uh, he went on a hunting trip with a, um, uh, three or four uh, rednecks um, um, who were real macho types of men, and he was telling them how attracted he was to them. Um, oh, let's see, what else was in the movie. Um, uh, there were all sorts of, oh, then at the very end of the movie, um, he he sort of switched sides and he came out as a character called um, Straight Jack. And he was talking about what a straight man he was and how he would fight anybody and that he wanted to kill fags. And, and another guy crawled into the ring, it was a setup. And by the end of it, he was kissing the other man. And the audience went berserk. They were trying to kill him. I mean, he was really in danger. So, yeah, in this movie, the, the idea was uh, uh, to create every homophobe's worst nightmare and to expose the ignorance, um, the potential for uh, violence, uh, you know, as we see with gay bashing, and, um, and, 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 and to mock that. Um, uh, I, there were there, some gay groups embraced the movie and got that point. Um, I think it was Glad that came out and felt that um, because he was playing such a stereotype of a gay man, that the the movie would only reinforce that stereotype in people who were uh, who were viewing the movie. Our organization has been in the forefront of uh, advocating a full uh, and unequivocal. Uh, gain lesbian rights, as we have in, in terms of uh, uh, ending all ca causeless hatred across the board. And there was another wonderful, like a genius of a picture with uh, Ben Stiller and, um, and Downey uh, Jr. and, uh, and others, uh, where uh, there was protest from the community that said the word retard had not been used in decades of this movie, all of a sudden rejuvenated the word retard. And I actually went back to the movie to see it again to find out where they, they used the word retard. I didn't even, and they were right, but I ha, it hadn't sunk into me. I thought there was a brilliant performance uh, uh, by the uh, character of the producer, uh, by, by uh, Tom Cruise, uh, but he didn't use it. And, and the argument was that across the country, the uniform, they should never have used the word retard. Do you, do you know uh, what I'm talking about? Yeah, I've heard about it. I didn't see the movie, but I heard about it. But why retard uh, alone? I mean, moron, idiot, those are also uh, scientific terms that apply to a, a, a level of a person's intelligence. And we, 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 those terms don't seem to be uh, 
um, ostracized by political correctness. I don't know. Well, you know why? Why just the term retard? I, I couldn't understand it, and uh, I welcome anybody from the advocacy of this organization to, to come on and, and present that point of view. But, but Moron has a clinical, you know, uh, uh, application to it. Uh, absolutely, and it's been a, a, a focal point of slapstick comedy throughout right, the right. years. You know, you hit someone in the head and say, Moron! <laughs> oh, no. right. Nobody's taking any kind of pejorative uh, attitude from, from hearing this and, and saying this was a comedy and, and comedy should have unlicensed bounds as long as it's funny and not meant to be hurtful. Would you agree? Yeah. All right, now, now Richard, you, you and I go back a long time and we, we represent in some, some aspects com, compatible points of view and other aspects divergent points of view and, and, and you've come to recognize how correct I've been over all the years. I'm just uh, you know, flabbergasted that you say we've been around for a long time and, and that we are becoming the old timers. It's, it's, it's hardly conceivable to me. And you know, Soupy Sales just died. I grew up with Soupy Sales, you know. I mean, for the generation of kids now, my show was their soupy sales. And and your show was an absolute pioneer. Pioneer and... and so was soupy sales. Reality. I was more influenced by soupy sales. Remember the pies in the face on my show? Soupy sales used to have those pies in the face. And, the, and he would play all those characters like Philo Kvetch and I would be the detective. I mean, I didn't realize until soupy sales died because I was a big fan when I was in elementary school. But when I went back and looked back over some of the clips, I said, oh, my God, do you know how much, um, you know, the development of the Richard Bay show really owed to Soupy Sales? Well, I owe very little to Soupy Sales, I must say, because, because I was always uh, not physical. I was always intellectual. And, and the issues I pioneered, that there was a conspiracy on 9-11, from, from, from the same fringe Muslim terrorist that was that came from Rabbi Kahana, as you know, and that has stayed here. And 18 years later, we're living with it again. But you were one of those to recognize that too, and uh, and it was to your credit. And you went, you went with the, we went with this back and forth through TV and radio, uh, between t TV, radio, and film, because well, you've done all three. Well, that's Which is true. your favorite? Uh, probably theater. Why? Because it's like life. It's, it's there, and then it's gone. I mean, you do it live. It's, not, um, it's, it's an experience that is created between the actor and the audience and the play. And it exists for the two hours that you create this fantasy together, that you're transported to another place, somebody's bedroom or ancient Rome or Macbeth's castle and the whole concept that people will sit there live with you and make believe with you you're joined with them in this experience as if you're all in a dream together and also as an actor on the stage even though you have the script and you have rehearsed it every show is different because the audience is different, because you ate something different for lunch, because all of a sudden you're sharper that night, or maybe the other actors, everything just clicks on that one night where you have the perfect show. So it's, um, you're alive. I, I, perhaps it's what a, you know, a, a person in sports or in the Olympics feels when they you know, when they go out and they and they look for the you know that record breaker every night you go out on that stage and you try to do the best that you possibly can and um, you create something in that moment and then it's over and I also miss the camaraderie I like that um, I like the feeling of building something with people uh, the other actors the director the playwright you know if he's a living playwright that you work with um, it's it's like it, it's like when you went to summer camp, and summer camp was over, and you said, "Oh, goodbye." But you remember, yeah, and you even have friendships that go on, and when you see them in the future, you feel connected to all the other people who were in the camp. Well, it's the same way when you're in the theater. There is a, a, a connection between all these people because you've um, you've been vulnerable in front of each other, 
and you've created something all together. It may be over, but that that bond that you have with those people, you know, lasts really a lifetime. I uh, have been a musician all my life. I've performed, I don't know how many states and how many how many different uh, types of audiences is exactly as you say, each performance is different. And uh, it was a different part of my life. And that's how I look upon it, the part of the life that's over and is gone. And, and I enjoyed it very much. And I have friendships from there. And they're all calling up for Facebook. Uh, I had a dear friend from there here in the studio here for the Facebook. And, and I, a hundred people from the band are bothering me with the Facebook. The life is over. The life is gone, and I prefer the confines of a closed studio. I just went back to Fox, and, and I was at uh, another station here about copyright law uh, in, the, in the open and in, in battle with professors. And, uh, and, 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 uh, What's your opinion about copyright law? Because I'm really interested in that, too. I, I mean, I think it's an abomination what they've done with copyright law in this country. That was the opinion of the expert from Temple Law School. It was held at the Princeton Club. And I could tell you all about that privately, but my, my right. opinion is... Let's, we'll talk about it over dinner, but 95, what is it, 95 years now? Copyright law is said to be almost unenforceable in regard to the Internet. Oh, you mean that copyright? You mean, mm -hmm. you know, right. But I'm talking about what Congress did, the Sonny Bono Act that they did for Disney, where they enabled the copyright to last for 95 years. I mean, listen, you're right. I think we should, you're right, we should be able to enforce a copyright law for a specified period of time. But almost a hundred years is ridiculous, and it's not what the founders meant when they, when they uh, you know, isn't co copyrights in the Constitution, isn't it? Of course, it's a property. It's a property right. Right. Course, but, but this is a separate uh, subject. Uh, and, and, uh, but do you think it's a property right that should, should last for in perpetuity? No, no, it's restricted, and it's all a question of, of uh, what type of property we're talking about. There's patents, there's copyright, and I am a photographer, and I will enforce my pictures for all eternity if I can. But l l let's go to some other type of property. Right. Now, you've been the victim of a fraud. And I, you've been, you brought it up to me. In the last few minutes, we have uh, briefly say uh, what has happened to you, and uh, I will go into the remedies. I had every cent that I own, and you didn't believe it. You said, how could this be? Every, every cent that I had was in a fund that was managed by one of my best friends from high school. It ironically happened to be Far Rockaway High School, which is also where Bernie Madoff went. But my friend who ran this fund, his sister was my first girlfriend in high school. So I had every cent invested with him, and he said, hey, listen, you can treat this like a bank. If you have an emergency, I'll write you a check. You take it out. You can ha get a monthly disbursement, which I, I did get. I quit a job to take care of some personal reasons, and I would get a monthly disbursement you know, from the fund. It would be deposited directly into my checking account. And then last May, he did something, uh, or he's alleged, I should say properly, to have done something uh, felonious with some of the money. He didn't steal it for himself, but he used it for an improper purpose. And the banks froze everything. At the moment they did that, I had $300 in my wallet. I had $3 in my ATM. And I had a rent check that bounced and a credit card check that uh, was about to be mailed out. And that's all I had in terms of cash in the world. And so I was completely broke. And uh, I may be broke, but I do have a wealth of friends, and a lot of my friends stepped in. I went to work. I worked two jobs, one part-time and the other one full-time. And I sold everything I could get my hands on, you know, that had any kind of value to it. But one thing you find is that the only thing that really does have value is gold in times like these. I'm, you know, uh, I'm reading Sweet Francaise right now, which is a, a, about the, the people who fled Paris as the Nazis were approaching. And they wanted to take their linens, they wanted to take the drapes, and they wanted to take the furniture. But in the end, the only thing that really had any value was jewelry. And that's sort of the time we're living in now, too. So I, I you know, I, had, I sold my comic book collection, my father's coin collection, my mother's jewelry. I borrowed money, I ran up credit card debt, and um, it's still frozen. They, they told me in May that it would take two or three weeks to get the money back. They told me in July that uh, we could expect to attach our money in September. Well, here it is, December 1st, and um, 
we still have no idea when we, there's 95 investors, there's 70 million dollars invested, leveraged out to 300 million, and there are people losing their homes. There are people who have, you know, who don't know how they're going to survive if we don't get an imminent uh, uh, ability to to attach some of our money. And what I have to do is just. Uh, you know, pack it in and go to Florida for a few months, uh, where my father left us a condo that's already paid off, and uh, figure out p Plan B, because the place where I was working went under, um, you know, uh, in the middle of, of November. So once that happened, I said, uh, I can't go on, because I, I literally, you know, had, had I wasn't, it wasn't my last cent, because I had $300 in my pocket, but that was it. Well, Richard, you, first of all, you're one of the most talented people out there, and there are very, very few people skilled in radio, TV, film, and theater. So uh, those skills uh, can get you work all over the one world. One would think so. And, and, and not just think, uh, <laughs> one knows so. And, and those kind of skills survive every economy. Second of all, you have redress. So there are a million remedies for this redress. And I, uh, you know, the, the Securities Exchange Commission is out there, and, and uh, you know, you, you, you're silenced every time you try to say something at your meetings. I'm not trying to intervene, nor no, can no, I, I in I any way. I understand. I understand. But, but the, 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 I had $300 in my pocket for most of my life, and that was it. For up till now, up till now, $300 is plenty of money to me. And, and, and that's... And uh, how do you think the show survives <laughs> on, on 30 cents a day and blacks and Jews in conversation, 20 cents a day. And uh, we, we have yet to have a fundraiser. And for goodness sakes, let, let this serve as an example to all of you out there. This, uh, you know, blacks and Jews in conversation needs more money than Richard May, for God's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, I'm giving you the last minute here. To, to tell me, uh, tell me uh, the legacy of, of our economy, given all of this. The legacy of our economy, we're in the middle of it. But, uh, you know, it's getting to look, uh, you know, we, we see all the figures. You know what the legacy of this economy is? I, I am a capitalist. I believe that hard work, dedication, talent, uh, taking risks should all be rewarded. But what we have now is a, is a capitalist system that is so broken that exists to reward people who destroy financial institutions and companies, leveraged buyouts that destroy businesses, um, uh, uh, creations of, of wild speculations like credit default swaps and, uh, and uh, the people that did destroyed Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers all walked away with hundreds of millions of dollars. If that's capitalism, if you want me to believe in that system, well, then I don't. I don't believe people well, should be rewarded for destroying things. Well, thank you very much. I welcome you on uh, a bright future to you uh, anyway. And uh, you and Michael Moore agree with each other 100%. <laughs> thank you. And uh, Is that it? No, I don't agree with Michael Moore. I, I believe in capitalism, but what we have now is not capitalism. To reward people, are we off the air yet? Well, Michael Moore says the same thing. No, Michael Moore says get rid of capitalism no no he says no he does not he says you cannot capitalism is evil and you cannot have a capitalist system it isn't inherently evil it's uh, but what we have right now it, it is um, it is sick no Mike my, my, are we still on the air Michael Moore says that capitalism as it used to be is what he wants the capitalism well, we have which now what, what, what capitalism? capitalism not the capitalism of the robber barons you know we don't want no, that no, no, either no. 20 30 years ago yeah all right yeah, yeah. that's what he says that's well what you point. disagree with that no all right so then you're on his side too aren't you i i really am <laughs> all right thank you